Hello, and welcome to None of the Above. My name is Steve Nemirovsky, and I'm your host. Uh, today, uh, being the summer, it's that time of the year when the Aspen Institute is conducting the Ideas Fest, and we try and go and steal really smart people to come and appear on the show and talk about politics. For those of you that haven't seen the show before, uh, we're here to talk about why the system is dysfunctional and polarized, but more importantly, in every show, we try and talk about how to fix that, how to take a system that's dysfunctional and polarized and make it better. Uh, well, today I stole from the Aspen Institute uh, Professor Muirhead from Dartmouth, and I'm, I'm going to read this because I couldn't remember, but he's, he's actually the uh, Robert Clements Professor of Democracy and Politics. I love that title. And if he wasn't married, probably be a great pickup line in a bar, you know. Either he, that it would be the worst pickup line in the history more like of that. bars. I'm the Robert Clements <laughs> I don't think professor. that's going to work. I don't. So anyway, I'll try it just for fun. We're honored today to have Professor Muirhead here. I'm going to talk about a book he wrote called the Promise of Party in a Polarized Age. The Promise of Party in a Polarized Age. It's a terrific book. I just finished it over the weekend. And uh, I think it's a terrific book, among other things, because we're going to talk about it later. It actually agrees with me that maybe having a third party to fix some of these problems is the way to go. So in, pre in preparing for today's interview, I, I watched an interview uh, with Professor Muirhead on another show. And he was introduced as a um, political philosopher. So above everything else I just said, that was the best part of all for me. I've never had a political philosopher on the show before. So today we're going to welcome Professor Muirhead, political philosopher. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you. So Happy to a, be here. So I, did you invent that title? Or it was, I think, the un, Uncommon Ground or show or whatever the show is on? Yeah, isn't that great? Political a, you're right. Now, that is a great title. I'm with you. I don't think that's going to help in a bar either. But uh, no, it actually goes back to Socrates. He was the first political philosopher. Oh, he is? OK. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, Plato is a political philosopher, um, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and on down through Rousseau and Marx, and they're political philosophers because they're trying to get at the truth about politics. And, um, is that and like get, an oxymoron to get about the truth about politics? Kind of, because most of, you know, opinion is everything okay. in politics. Opinion is the fuel that, that, you know, makes the political fire burn. And, and the idea that you could get underneath or around or cross opinion to some truth, um, that's, pretty, that's a pretty radical idea. But that's the idea under, underlying uh, political philosophy. So part of what you do if you're a political philosopher is you teach the history of political philosophy, starting with Plato and Socrates and moving all the way down. And the other part of what you do is you, you get into arguments that are people are getting into today about what justice uh, means. Um, for instance, there's a basic question that Americans are debating right now. Should the government be responsible for helping citizens get access to health care? Or should the government just keep, you know, the government doesn't help us get access to hotel rooms. It doesn't help us get access to, you know, luxury vehicles. Why should it help us get access to expensive health care? Um, and some argue that it's a matter of justice. You know, all citizens, if they have medical need, should get care, Whether, or even if they're poor, even if they're not connected, even if no one knows them, even if they're old. Others say, no, um, you, you should find your own way to medical care and rely on yourself um, for, for that, and the government shouldn't help out. That's a disagreement about justice, and when you and I get into that disagreement or anybody, you're engaging in political philosophy. So you don't have to be a professor to be a political philosopher. Well, I aspire to that. Maybe one day I'll be on a TV show and they can call me that, and I'll say, finally, I graduated. Yeah, you might, that might be what you are. I made the big time. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have this whole interview prepared, but I'm going to now start totally differently because of what you just said. I, I disagree with you in this respect. I don't think we're having the debate you just described. And, I, and, I'm, and to me, the question is, why aren't we having that debate? Why are we having a debate between who's killing who the fastest, who's denying service to who the fastest or in the most brutal way, shape, or form, and who's doing everything horrible to, to the humanity. Why, why is the, our political system not allowing us to have that philosophical discussion that you said we should be having right now? Yeah, and, and I'm, I, well, look, I'm completely with you in feeling a frustration that, that we're not getting at the, the really interesting, deep questions that motivate a disagreement, say, about you know, um, the Affordable Care Act. Obamacare. Instead, there's there's just a lot of um, you know name calling and uh, and highly charged sort of calculated rhetoric being thrown around, 
And I was really disappointed at the time the Democrats passed the Affordable Care Act because I thought even then, in their moment of victory, Obama, you know, Pelosi, Reid in the Senate, they didn't really get it, the real philosophy underlying that policy. They, they talked about how the Affordable Care Act would solve certain technical problems. There was something called a donut hole, which is a little gap in, I think, Medicare coverage. It solved that. It would, it would take care of people with pre-existing conditions, a discrete group um, that now has a benefit. It would take care of families with children you know, between 20 and 25. Another discrete group gets a benefit. But, but they weren't talking the language of the common good. They weren't saying, this is the kind of country we think we want to become, a country where if someone is sick, they get health care just because they're sick, regardless of wealth. That's the, that's the, that's the commitment that we Democrats think citizens owe each other. That's the deep principle. That's the deep view of the country. Obama didn't, get, didn't speak to it. Other Democrats really didn't speak to it. Um, the only one who did was Ted Kennedy, and, and he was really in his you know, final hours, and he didn't have the energy to really inflect the, the, the vocabulary as powerfully as he might otherwise have. So yeah, from the beginning, we've let the big questions you know, shift to the side. And I think the Republicans have an interesting argument. They think, rock bottom, they think the government just should not be involved in guaranteeing access to health care. Um, and, and they're, even they're afraid to say that. So we have, each side is afraid to utter the, the big principle that motivates them. Well, and even now, uh, the Democrats passed uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, and other Republicans have been dedicated to tearing it down and getting rid of it. And uh, I'm trying to follow this in the press, okay? Now, last week or the last 10 days, I, between snippets on TV and what I saw in the press, I can't tell you how much volume was dedicated to the fact that in the Senate they're working in secret to do something, okay? That was the noise. Now the Senate bill has come out. I, I defy anybody to go to any of those papers or places that only one of the rhetoric would be about is this being done in secret or not, and find a place where you can actually understand what just did happen in the Senate so you can maybe participate in this debate if you wanted to. So it just seems to me the system is so dysfunctional. Not only don't, don't we have debate, you can't even go anywhere anymore to find out the facts you need to drive a debate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the Republicans are trying to do something that's almost never been done, which is to take a, a broad-based benefit and eradicate it. Um, the, you know, the politics of retrenchment is very, it's almost impossible to, 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 to wind back benefits. Adding new benefits, that we know how to do. Um, to add something to, to Medicare, to add prescription drug coverage. I mean, even Republicans know how to do that. I think George W. Bush was the one who did that. But eradicating benefits is, is very hard politics. And that's what the Republican even, Party... Even if you had a functional system. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, here's something, you're used to it, you have it, we're going to take it away. Um, you know, it's hard for democratically elected representatives to do that. And that's what the, that is, oddly enough, the number one priority of the Republican Party today. They've been campaigning on eradicating Obamacare since it was passed. Um, and, and so they have set for themselves a very, very difficult task. That's why they had to do it in secret. They can't let it be known. They don't want it known that 20 million people are going to be thrown off the insurance rolls. Um, you know, they don't want it to be known that the poorest Americans are going to be worse off, self-employed Americans are going to be worse off, and the wealthiest Americans who make, whose households make more than $450,000 a year are going to get a tax cut because they're eradicating the tax that went along with Obamacare. Only wealthy people pay it. It's a capital gain surcharge. You have to make a lot of money to, to pay it. They, they don't want anyone to know that. That's why they're acting in secret. Now, why it's hard for you to get at the details of the policy now that it's been published, that's kind of a failure of, of the media. Um, I think the media will catch up with the bill. And in a week or two or three, you'll be able to get at those details. I think the Republicans want to get this thing passed before the media has a chance to really digest it and explain it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we get government by sound bite, so that makes me crazy. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, it's, uh, it, and I don't think it's as effective as, um, as, as, as people assume it is. I actually think that each side would probably be better off 
if they explain things um, a little bit more fully and, and with a little bit more confidence in the capacity of people to understand uh, a long explanation, something that takes more than 30 seconds. Two so, minutes, say. So I, I don't always read book covers, but before I read your book, I happened to open a book cover, and there it says, write the first thing, and you may not have written this, but your editor or someone did, says, at the root of America's broken politics is hyperbolic partisanship. That's right there. Wow, wow. So, Can I look at that? Absolutely. <laughs> so, at the root of America's broken politics. Well, on our show, which we, we, you know, we try to understand how the system get dysfunctional and polarized and everything, and you, you attribute a lot of what's wrong with our political system today, this hyperbolic partisanship. So tell, tell us how you came to think that way, and uh, then we'll, we'll kind of tease our way through some of your theories. Well, so and the, the nuance there is I'm, I'm pro-partisan. I actually like parties, and I like partisan debate. Um, I actually think that a, a yeah, you go to parties and say, I'm the Robert Clemens professor. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, I go to parties. <laughs> that's right. I'm a party guy. Um, and I, you know, I think it's probably good for the country to have conservatives and, and liberals and maybe others too, but who are really debating or, or disagreeing about fundamental questions. I think that's healthy and I'll tell you why. Um, we have choices to make in this country that we, the people, just don't want to make. Um, since Reagan was elected in 1980, the American people have voted for tax cuts every time they've had a chance. And the American people have voted for entitlement expansion every time they've had a chance. And we've been doing both. And the combination of those two things is a structural deficit. Um, there are economists who will say we don't have to worry about the deficit. It's not as high a fraction of GDP as it might be. We can you know, always tax our way out of it or cut spending if we need to be, need to. We're in better shape than Japan or something like that. Nonetheless, in a time of economic expansion and low unemployment, we have a whopping $600 billion deficit. Um, and, and, and when times get bad, that deficit becomes quickly a $2 trillion deficit, as we saw in 2010. So, or, or a cumulative $20 trillion deficit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I would say we have a basic choice to make. We can pay for the government we want, which is going to mean more taxes, or we can cut government and get the taxes we want, which are, which are relatively low, one way or the other. Each is an honest path. And more and more I see you know, Democrats standing up for a government that does a lot and that taxes to fund it. Obama was very consistent. He added this benefit, Obamacare, and he added a tax to pay for it. Um, more and more conservatives are consistent. They say, you know what, we've got to cut government, cut Obamacare, because we want to cut taxes. Um, you don't have to agree with that, but it's a consistent and respectable position. And, and there is, I think, a real choice to make that Americans just don't want to make. They want low taxes and, and large government or, or a, you know, um, good entitlement state. And, and that's incoherent. So, so there's something good about partisanship. The hyper-partisanship that's, that's killing the system is, is the, you know, the, the partisanship that's motivated more by detestation of the other side than it is by disagreement with the other side's conception of the country. So remember, you know, a couple, gosh, what was it, four, three or four years ago, Obama, in his second term, wanted to pass uh, immigration reform. I wish he had, because if he had, we wouldn't have had the demagoguery about immigration and, you know, by Trump in the last campaign. What was stopping him? Well, the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate. They also wanted immigration reform, or so they said. I'll bet they wish they did, too, because they, they might have had Rubio instead of Trump as their nominee. Um, but they wouldn't. They said, well, we're waiting to hear from President Obama. You know, what's his plan? And President Obama said, I'm not going to put out a plan, because as soon as I put out a plan, you are going to oppose it just because it's my plan. I could put out the same plan that you guys come up with, and if, it's, if my name's on it, you'll oppose it because you don't care what's in the plan, you just want to defeat me. And Mitch McConnell said, when Obama was first elected, that, or, or he said, I think, in, maybe in 19, 2010, when the Republicans got control of the legislature, said the first goal of the Republican Party is defeating Barack Obama. And, and when, it, when the only goal of a party is to kill off the other side, when it's no longer about policy, when it's no longer about philosophy and conception of the common good, then you have a kind of hyper-toxic partisanship 
that prevents compromise, prevents working together. It prevent, it, in the long run, it'll, it'll make it hard for us to belong to the same country. So, so and, that's and, what I'm and, talking about. And of about. course, that's the exact same position the Democrats have taken. It's just that they learned from Mitch McConnell. So they don't have a leader who's spoken that. It's just that right. the second right. President Trump was elected, they have all dedicated themselves to whatever, whatever he's for, we're and, against. And they, yeah. Right, they've dedicated, exactly. That, that's Although they saying. haven't really been, I mean, we don't know if that's true. I, I think Democrats would vote for an infrastructure bill. I think, I think if Trump were serious about that, he could probably pass it with a minority of Republican votes and a majority of Democratic votes. If you could get, um, if you could get Speaker Ryan to bring it to the floor, I think Democrats would probably pass that. When you look back to the early years of the George W. Bush administration, Democrats backed Bush on education. They backed Bush on no, no child, child left, left behind. behind. Was uh, one of the last yeah. few times, one of the last times we had a bipartisan piece yeah. of major legislation. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I think, I, uh, we'll. You're right. There's, they're feeling pretty obstreperous right now. Yeah. But. Yeah. I, 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 I and I've become kind of, I'm with you in the fact that we need parties, but I've become anti-party in the sense that I think the two parties are so broken that, as you said, they can't communicate. They're in these silos that people talk about all the time. So when I was brought up, and, uh, and I started most of my political life in, in the 90s, uh, someone who was a mentor of mine said, here's what you do. You fight around the election time, but right after the election, you get together and govern. We right. don't govern anymore. Right. And now that, we just have continuous campaigns, right. so and we this, just continuously fight. Yeah, you're so right. So you, I mean, the season of campaigning has to give, give way to the work of governing. But it doesn't. And, and now it's, a, it's so campaigning. How, how did we get there? How, how did that part happen? Yeah, uh, it, it may have happened, and this may be a gift of the 1990s. Um, and, and, and a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, it, okay. it's the gift you can't, you can't give away. Um, you know, Clinton adopted a kind of almost permanent campaign mentality in the White House, um, but, but he also faced a much, much more vigorous and full-throated opposition from the legislature led by Newt Gingrich. And, and Newt Gingrich had no time for formalities or niceties, um, the sort of uh, custom of bipartisanship. He, he, um, he went after Clinton with everything he had, and he won for the first time in, in was it 55 years, the Republicans under Newt Gingrich got control of the House of Representatives. Right. So I, I think from that moment, from 1994 on, we've, we've seen the two sides almost stay in campaigning mode. Um, and, and it just gets ratcheted up a little bit with each new president, with each new cycle. Right, and when you're constantly in campaign mode, there is no time left for governing. Right. So in your book, you write about what you call high partisanship and low partisanship. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about those dynamics. Yeah, you? so that, that's, um, you know, I like high part. When I think of high partisanship, it's the partisanship. That's what we have in Colorado. We have marijuana <laughs> and we have high partisanship. I, yeah, and it probably goes, does it go okay? I bet I it's fun. We get problems, though. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's right. And, and, and the idea is by high partisanship, I mean kind of lofty okay. or noble or principled partisanship when, when you think that what's motivating the difference is a disagreement about principle. Um, you know, there's this idea in the Democratic Party that, that what politics is about is, is sharing risk, that, that citizens should stand together and, 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 and together carry the risk that one of them might suffer something bad, like a disease. And so we all chip in and pay for caring for that disease when one person suffers it. One person gets in a car accident. We all pay the costs, in a way, of treating that victim in the accident. The Republican Party um, has a view that individuals should benefit from the risks that they decide to take and, um, and should also have, bear the bad consequences of risks that they assume that, that don't work out. And that we shouldn't, we shouldn't socialize risk because when we do socialize risk, we allow people to be irresponsible. And, and, we, and we take from people any incentive to, to, to take a risk, to, to do something big and daring and risky. Um, those are just different philosophies. Um, and, and they each have a kind of truth to them. And, and depending on the moment, depending on the policy, one or the other might be persuasive. That's the big, lofty, noble, or high partisanship that I don't think, I, I don't think we want to be without. I think we want that in our politics. Um, low partisanship is just about 
winning the next election, doing whatever it takes to win the next election. Um, and uh, it's all about strategy, and it ends up in just enmity and just hating the other side. Now look, the two things are connected. You don't make your conception of the common good powerful unless you win elections. So, so if the Democrats want to bring back Obamacare, they're going to have to win an election. They're going to have to think like low partisans. Who do we run? What should they say? What shouldn't they say? What kind of party should we be? What, what, do, we, what do we say about the other side? What's going to work? Um, so you're never going to be without it. But, but what you really want is a balance where, where high partisanship, the philosophy that makes sense of your party, is what's driving the thing. And, and when, when you get rid of that and all you have left is the, is the low partisanship, then you have this sort of toxic form of hatred that, that's not about doing things. It's not about activating a, a, a philosophy. It, it, it's not even about imagining your country as you think it might ideally look. It's just about hating the other side and beating the other side. That's all it's about. Um, and that, that's what happens when low partisanship takes over. In fact, uh, one of the scary sentences in your book, you say, in all likelihood, normal politics is not coming back. And you say, intense partisanship is the new normal. So that's kind of scary to me. If intense partisanship is the new normal, how do we escape that? How do you get out of it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, and, and this is sort of dissatisfying because I, I, it's hard to imagine this coming to pass. I think we have to learn how to disagree with each other. We're not going to get to a place where we just stop disagreeing, where, where somehow the party disagreement goes away and, and we all just stand together and we vote for the same people who want to do the same things. That's not going to happen. We really, I, I think, con, you know, the, con, the, the cons, conservative party is stronger today than it's ever been. Liberals are stronger today than they've been since the 1930s. Um, so, so we have a very vigorous partisanship, and it's not going away. What we, what, we, what we have to learn how to do is really disagree with each other, respectfully and constructively. And, and this is my job. I mean, I work in a university, and I teach, I teach students, and I teach them about politics. And, and it's my job, and, and the job of people like me, to teach students how to disagree with each other, how to have an argument how to be disagreed with, and, and not hate the other side, and not just disparage the other side. Um, and, and I think our you know, universities are failing in this right now. I think what's happening in our universities is there's a you know, powerful desire to get rid of disagreement there, too. So yeah, that, I, we don't have time for the university yeah. thing today. But, so, that's so, a but you want to know the solution. The solution is that. It's education. People have to learn how to disagree. It doesn't just happen in colleges. It's not even happening in colleges the way it should. It, it, it can happen. It's more likely to happen at, at the bar or at a party um, or on the street um, or, or even in the media when, when people encounter each other on, on political shows. And too often we just have conservative shows where everybody agrees with each other and liberal shows where everybody agrees with each other. And, and we, we don't see debate. We don't see it modeled. We don't see it happen. And we're, 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 we're forgetting how to engage in it. Well, is that, and again, is that part of that silo thing going on. So here's a concern I have. I've been thinking about writing, writing this. I'll just give you the idea you write about it. Because okay. you, you're a political <laughs> philosopher. Yeah, right. <laughs> You, you're teaching students now, they're you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, maybe you have a grad student here and there, whatever. Uh, my, my oldest daughter's 30 right now. As far as I can tell, her generation, I think she's one of the, or an early millennial, they have never seen government work. They've only lived in a dysfunctional time for, for, to a certain extent. How do you take generations now of people who have only observed government failing how do you reverse that? They don't even have a model to draw from. And how do you teach that? Yeah, I mean, one of the most important things we can learn, I think, about government, or what it's succeeded at and failed at in the last 50, 60 years. It's not the kind of thing people ask, and it's not the kind of thing that's often taught. But you're right. The, the last 15 years have been pretty dismal. And I think that's why you get these people coming from outside the parties, like Trump or Bernie Sanders. Um, taking them over almost in Bernie's case. Because let's look back at the last 15 years. What you see are the leaders of each party, 
failing in a very, very devastating way. Conservatives said in 2003, we needed to invade Iraq in order to make the Middle East safe for democracy. Don't worry, they said, six days, six weeks. It's not going to take six months. Um, this is going to be easy. We'll be greeted as liberators. By 2006, it was a civil war that no one could deny. And I think everyone now views it as a calamity. In fact, the Republican nominee and the sitting president, Donald Trump, ran saying it was a failure. So massive failure, a five, possibly five trillion dollar failure. Imagine what that would do for in infrastructure in the United States if we hadn't poured it into the sands of Iraq. Liberal uh, elites told us in the 1990s, let's deregulate. Um, deregulate finance, deregulate the banks. The economy will grow, it'll be more efficient, it'll be more productive. Well, we didn't get sustained 3% growth or 2% growth. What we got was a financial sector meltdown that nearly took the global economy down with it in 2008. And what we had to do, we are told by our government, in order to meet that threat was bail out the very bankers who had caused the meltdown. One of the most distasteful things you know, I've seen in, in, in my adult life from politics. So massive failure from right-wing elites and left-wing elites, um, two, two big failures. And, and I think that has depleted uh, trust and confidence in traditional elites, elites represented by people like um, Hillary Clinton and, um, and Jeb Bush. Those were, the, those were the presumptive nominees, and one of them was going to be president. And, and neither one is president because I think of those failures by those parties. But if we look back before that, you know, at what the government's done over the last 50, 60 years, there are, there are some serious successes that, you know, I'd like your daughter's generation to be aware of. Old people aren't impoverished. It was a massive problem. Right. And people get too old to continue working. Some people could move in with their children. Many people couldn't. Poverty among the elderly population was an intractable problem solved. Old people aren't eating dog food anymore because of Social Security. And, and, and that's the government. Um, our, our rivers, as you know, were so polluted, they were lighting up on fire in, the, in 1970. When I was a kid, the idea that you could swim in the river that went through my town, Manchester, New right. Hampshire, was unthinkable. Because you would come, in, you'd, you'd come out of that water with a disease. You'd be in the hospital, so full of fecal matter and whatever else. It's now perfectly clean. The Clean Water Act cleaned up rivers all over this country. We were worried about the eradication of wilderness. Um, very prudent worry, 1964, Wilderness Act, Wilderness Preservation Act. And now there are wilderness areas around, especially this area, the west, and, um, and they're very special. They're not just natural, you know, national parks or national forests. I would, uh, you know, I don't know a lot about it, but on the sort of back of the envelope sensibility, I'd say, looks like a success. We have wilderness because we preserved it. So, so, you know, we shouldn't be one-sided in, in assessing the success and failure of government. There's some real failures, and that's all you can really see looking back in the net last, since 2000. But, but there are some stunning successes, too, you know. Well, and, and again, you addressed that in your book, and uh, the book we're talking about is, uh, I'm going to have to read the cover in front of me, The Promise of Party in a Polarized Age. We've been talking with Professor Muirhead from Dartmouth College. And what I'm going to do now is tell you, that you're going to have to read the book because when he gave his last answer, um, if you read the book, you'll understand how he gets there. Because what Professor Muirhead does is he walks us through really the transition from a time when government worked and maybe, maybe the golden period of politics in the United States from the 30s to the 60s-ish. And that explains really how the system starts breaking down with the passage of the uh, Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. And, really how the parties get uh, rejiggered at that time, and the Democrats switch from the South to the North, et cetera. So I want you to read this book. Uh, as always, uh, I've had fun. And Professor, thanks for being here today. Right on. Thank you. And we hope that you've all had fun in watching the show. Uh, if you want to catch all our shows, you can go to grassrootstv.org, grassrootstv.org. And we also have uh, individualized interviews from our shows at our um, YouTube site, which is noneoftheabove.tv, noneoftheabove.tv. Remember, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Thank you.